Support for Lab Out Loud is brought to you by the National Science Teachers Association. Find out more at nsta.org. You're listening to the Lab Out Loud podcast, Science for the Classroom and Beyond. And our guest today designs science games, and he's here to help us understand what makes a good game. What's very tough about making a lot of these science games, though, is to actually make them games. It's a little bit of a tension when you're teaching scientific material like this because you have these principles that you're trying to sort of hammer home, but you really got to make sure that I want to make something that really has like a competitive strategy and that it's different every single time you play it. That's up next on Lab Out Loud, but first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler, and you just heard a clip from Nathan Schreiber. He's the owner of Science Ninjas and has been spending many a years making games and comics for science education. My co-host, Brian Bartell, and I sat down to talk to Nathan a while back about his company, Science Ninjas, and how he got into making games for science. How did I get into science? Um, Well, I came at this really from... uh from a comics and illustration angle, I sort of developed a reputation as making comics that explained things and explained complicated things. Like I got tapped to do a, um, a graphic novel that explained the, um, the, uh, the affordable care act. The oh, Obama. really? Oh. Yeah. So I worked on that with, um, Jonathan Gruber. He's a healthcare economist. Um, and you know, it's obviously a comic that takes something that's pretty complex and that a lot of people are intimidated by. And, um, and then I broke that down into, you know, bite-sized chunks that people could understand. Um, after doing that, I did some comics for, um, FEMA for, um, uh, federal emergency management and assistance. Sure. Uh, that, these were just comics that, taught kids how to navigate natural disasters, um, you know, what to do in case of like a hurricane using like characters, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, um, maybe not volcanoes. I think I did like one thing on volcanoes. <laughs> mm-hmm. but That's the Hawaii edition. <laughs> yeah, maybe the Hawaii edition. But things that were, you know, like, like tornadoes are very relevant. Earthquakes are very relevant. Sure. Um, so I was just doing comics like that. And, um, and, at the same time, I was working on the, my own comics that, like, I'm just, I just, I'm really like a science enthusiast. I'm, I'm an engineer, um, but science is just something that fascinates me. And I just sort of had these ideas for these these comic characters called science ninjas. Like, they're just, you know, the name, the name says exactly what they are. Hmm. They are scientists who are also ninjas. And so I Perfect. made, um, yeah, very, very simple idea. <laughs> um, T-shirt worthy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely t-shirt worthy. So I just kept making some comics with, with those stuff. And and um, and then, you know, this is kind of a weird opportunity. I mean, just, I mean, life is a very circuitous path. Um, a friend of mine had a summer camp. That was his business. And um, he needed some programming for a summer camp. And he saw these science comics that I was doing. He's like, hey, why don't you come in and uh, you can show your comic, you can project it on the wall and lead kids through it. And then you can walk kids through a science experiment that you're talking about in this comic. And I was like, that's a pretty cool idea. So I started doing that. And then that became, you know, that became my business. And I started doing that at different camps all over New York City. Um, And so I was just, you know, while I was doing this, I was just really brainstorming all kinds of new ideas to to teach kids science and in just ways that, that would be easy for them and playful for them to understand. And I don't know when I had the idea, but I was just like, oh, what if what if you had a game that was like rummy, but instead of building suits, you were you were building molecules out of atoms from the periodic table. And that's kind of we saw Science Ninja, I think we saw it online a couple times, but it wasn't until um we went to the NSTA regional conference in Milwaukee and stumbled by your booth that we met face to face and uh, I saw some of your games in action. I actually have a video clip of you kind of starting a game with a few teachers. Let me play that right now. If you look at the colors on the cards. So this one is gray, yellow, and blue. If you look at the right hand column on the molecules and they're like, oh, okay. It's gray, yellow, and then there you go, base, you're natural. Okay, so they made a base. They can flip it over and go, oh, okay, I made sodium hydroxide. You can see the formula there. But they're feeling very smug because they have four points. But then you show up, you got this one right here. That's one, minus one, that's zero, so that's a molecule. It's the blue and red one. 
It's an acid. You can take your acid, you can neutralize that base, and reduce it to water and salt. So they have fewer points. And you go on. First things first, I don't think I want to play against you. You got it uh, quite down. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, though. As a chemistry teacher, I never heard... So you made sodium hydroxide, and you're kind of smug because you got four points. That never came up in my classroom. So, Nathan, tell us what was going on in that demonstration. Well, the the way that you play valence is, um, you know, there there's sort of a couple different strategies to winning the game. One, you can play very safe, and you can make stable compounds like carbon dioxide and salt, and they're worth fewer points because you're trying to get to ten points to win the game. Or you can make um, the basic molecules, which are worth more points, but they're vulnerable to somebody attacking them with an acid molecule. Like the point of the game is you're building molecules, and you're, each molecule is worth a certain amount of points. But you can knock people down with these valuable but vulnerable bases with your acid molecules. So mm. it's something that, that I'm really proud of is... There are a lot of like science games and, and chemistry games. And, you know, what, what we really wanted to do is we wanted to make the actual, like the really educational aspect of the game. We wanted to make that also the most interactive and the most fun part of the game. So the chemical reactions that happen in the game, and that's where you're learning, oh, okay, an acid breaks down in salt and water. Um, you know, like that's actually the most fun part of the game. Like, uh, yeah. any, anybody who plays Valence is going to walk away um, learning that an acid base reaction, the products are salt and water. And I actually had like, I had this amazing experience at um, Chicago Toy and Game Fair. This kid who was probably six or seven or something, and I'm doing my, my spiel. I'm in like full salesman mode and I'm telling him how, oh, okay. And then you break down this base. Uh, with this acid, and then it turns into water and salt. And the kid sort of looks at them, and he sort of, you know, like, furrows his brow a little bit. He's like, salt and water? Like the ocean? Is that how the ocean gets salty? <laughs> I just was <laughs> like... Oh, perfect. Yeah, actually, well, you know, know, curricularly, we don't tackle acid-base reactions until later grades, but... Uh, no, uh, <laughs> Take us cards you know, away. What's <laughs> but I do like your explanation there, because we do see some games every now and then. Sometimes they're packaged in a uh, a curriculum um like a textbook curriculum or sometimes we'll see like apps but a lot of these games are very much uh drills uh, they might be just simple counting um what you're describing has a little bit more strategy and understanding the science to be able to win well there's yeah, multiple a- pathways to to win that's what's really nice it is really a lot of alchemy um something that i'm like uh whenever i get a soapbox i like to uh I like to say in in, in this podcast, what a perfect soapbox. Um, It's very easy to talk about gamification. I feel like it's a very trendy word right now. Like everybody talks, oh, you got to gamify everything. But the quality of the gamification is is very critical. It's like if somebody told you like, oh, I have this like I have this cake and it's it's delicious and it's really healthy. Well, that's like a really great idea. But you know, you want (laughs) to. You'd want to eat it. You'd want to see the recipe. You know, it's it's very difficult to pull off something that is substantial and fun. And, and those two things really work together. And that is like, you know, that's really what I'm always trying to do is try to make like, you know, like I'm work- actually working on my first graphic novel right now. Um, well, not my first graphic novel, but my first science ninjas graphic novel. This is going to be a longer form thing that explains simple machines. And um yeah, it's just like making it substantial, really teaching the material, but also keeping it something that's going to like hold uh, a student's interest. Sure. It's you know what I hate about gamification? Tell me. At its root, it's it's manipulative. Like gamification in a lot of industries is about how to trick people into buying their stuff. So yeah. they, want, they want to gamify it. So really, a lot of times, I think the word gamification and education is getting misused what the what in your what you're doing I don't think is gamification it's using games to learn which is different than gamification which would be like setting up basically different you know rules and obstacle course uh, to you know to get through the course and a lot of times that can be I feel used as a manipulation form so like you we have websites and things that are gamifying their their user base or their their customers um, and it's and it's manipulating. I never like that. I don't think it has a place um, in education. It's dishonest. I, I'm not. I don't know if I'm above manipulating people. 
Uh, wait, wh- wait, how did you get us here on this show? Yeah, <laughs> wait, 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 me, wait, what? Let me, let me Why am I wearing that? a t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> something that I really like to do, though. Okay, so like Science Ninja's game, something that I, I mean, I'm an artist, and I really like to make the games look very good. Like, I really want it to be like a kid sees it and they go like, oh, I just want to play that just because it just because it looks cool. So I don't and it, really... it is gorgeous. Yeah, it, it really is. Well, that's 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 definitely a big part of the design, because because I, I do also feel like there's also a lot of educational materials that are kind of like science is fun. And um, the sort of uh, this is something I say a lot. If it looks like oatmeal, like kids won't eat it. <laughs> if it doesn't look like something cool, because because kids know what's cool, you know, that's like. Like kids always know what's cool, so yeah. it, it mm-hmm. can't be something that's like if it if it looks uncool, they're just gonna be like, well, like forget this. But I think it's I think you're hitting on something too. It's like there's this idea. It's like oh, kids like don't want to learn, and it's like I don't think that's true at all. Like no. I meet yeah, so it, yeah. many kids, and they they want to learn. It's just that oftentimes it's very challenging, or the material is presented in a way that that makes it very very dry. Or forced on one path of learning that doesn't align to the best way that they can learn, or, or yeah, they, yeah, exactly. you know, they can see the the phoniness in you know some of the apps that you were talking about earlier, Brian, where it's where it's it's just flashcards. Get the coins, <laughs> yeah, 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 and and then magic, it, you know magic. it doesn't take long for a kid to go, why do I care about this game? <laughs> yeah. And how can I get the most coins and yeah. not learn anything? That's what the gamification is. Then Nathan, I think what you're doing is you're not you're not making it cool for kids. You're showing that science can be cool. That that yeah. science is cool. Yeah, I'd like to think so. And um, I also think it's really um, I think it's very important too to have this sort of cartoon aspect to it as well because. Um, cartoons are are a really vital aspect of science. Like we don't, we usually call like like basically most science textbooks are actually comics. There's like tons of diagrams. Um, like a diagram is just a comic. That's yeah. really all it is. And and uh, like we have these ideas for what these things are. Like atoms in particular. Like we know. I mean, like we have this idea of what an atom looks like, but no one really knows what an atom looks like. It's a model. So, yeah, in, in, in essence, you have to make some kind of illustration or representation. And you're right. That exactly it. Yeah, it's a big it's a big part of it. And so I think like something that I would I would love to um, I'd also just love to work with more kids and have like I, I think something this is like something like, a, you know, maybe I'm tipping my hand too much here, but I'd love to have sort of like a Pictionary style game where where people are like explain you know that they're they're using their drawings to explain some sort of concept some sort of scientific mm. concept so i think i think that's like really I, and i think that that should be like really part of of science curriculum is you know getting kids to 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 model things you know i mean i know that that's a part of every science curriculum but just being more overt about it i mean it's like you look at science curriculums from like the 19th century and people had to take drafting courses because they needed to, you know, do all of these these really accurate drawings of different anatomical um, illustrations. Um, it's just a very useful skill to have. Mm-hmm. Well, and I don't think, I mean, in, Dale and I are tech coaches. And one of the things we see right now is that there's an awful lot of emphasis on content still, even with te- the technology that students have at their fingertips, and very little on design, on on how something looks as a way that it communicates your ideas to someone else. And that's important. We I think we lose sight of that. And I'm hoping that's the next iteration in how students use technology, but we're not quite there yet. I think it's really tough because technology evolves so fast. Um Honestly, it's like one of the reasons why I like working with, um, you know, with a card game. It's like a physical thing. I can wrap my head around it. I know like the format isn't going to undergo some sort of, you know, wild disruptive change like in the next mm-hmm. 50 years. So I think it is it is hard to like sort of optimize design in a, in a in a medium that's that's constantly changing. But yeah, the design and how things are presented to to students is it's very very critical i i mean it's just like i don't know i think i think there's a, a tendency um there's sort of like a bias against a lot of design in educational fields like or a bias against aesthetic mm, yes 
You know, I, I think there's just this idea. It's like, no, 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 no. It's it's substance over style, and style is 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 style is very important. Like it's like these are it's it's easy to trivialize them and say that they're un, unsubstantial, but it's like you're you're trying to get into um, the motivation of a learner, and um, you know, especially in terms of like what. I mean, I it is really hard for teachers out there because think of all the things that kids have to distract them these days. It is really it sure. is really, really a competitive market for for a kid's attention these days. So, you know, you really have to make something that's that's it's really engaging and you're gonna lean on you're gonna have to lean on aesthetics and design to do that. And you did that with Valence, which was the first game or your second game? Valence is the first game. Okay. So tell us about the second game. So Valence Plus is the second game and it, it's really just like like we made valence and a lot of people respond and they're like, Oh, this is great, but we want more elements. We want more molecules. We want more stuff. Like basically where we've had enough of valence. Like we, we play a lot <laughs> enough acids and bases. Let's get I on want with it. more elements. Well, we wait for a supernova, stuff, you know, it's very tricky though. And this is where I do think like, wow, if this was like an online game, I wouldn't have the same kind of constraints that I have because the thing is, if you just add a couple of elements and, and the thing is what I do with valence um, is I, I select a very specific oxidation state for every single element. So it's not like carbon can just combine with everything, like uh, uh, choose um, plus four for carbon's oxidation state so that it, you know, can combine with, you know, two oxygen molecules. Like it's, it's you know, we're... we're carbon's not the wild card here. Yeah. It's not, yeah, exactly. Like, like I, in valence plus, we actually introduced secondary uh, valence numbers, secondary oxidation states, like sulfur has a secondary oxidation state. You can flip it over and its oxidation state is plus six so that it can combine with three oxygens. Normally sulfur is, uh, its oxidation state in the game is minus two. So it just adds a little bit more complication. Like there's some elements that have um, different oxidation states. There's way more molecules. The thing is you add, you add just a few more <laughs> elements and you know that exponentially increases the amount of molecules. So oh, yeah. in, in valence, there's there's eight different types of molecules that you can make. I shouldn't say that they are specific molecules. You're making types of molecules, like you're making um, bases or you know you're mm -hmm. making salts. Um, in valence plus, there's 21, I think. Um, wait, or maybe it's 19. 19, yes. There's 19 different molecules that you can make, or classes of molecules that you can make. So it, it's just like you know, you're adding more complexity, it gets a little bit bigger. I think that it's also a little bit more of a gamer's game. Like, uh, like, like, you know, we knew that, that there'd probably be older players playing Valence Plus, so there's just a little bit more strategy in terms of, like, what you're going to do on your turn. Like, you can, there are, the way that you build molecules in Valence is you take the different elements, you add their, oxid their valence numbers up to zero, and then you match the colors on all of the elements with uh, the molecules that are on the board. Um, difficult to explain <laughs> just in words. Mm -hmm. um, but in Valence Plus, there are molecules that you can make, and you only make them through chemical reactions. So it's much more the way that like a chemical engineer, like, like my wife, who checks everything that I do, <laughs> makes sure that... <laughs> like my wife. <laughs> hey, okay, yeah, no kidding. Couldn't do any of this without her. Um, got to make sure I give a shout out to <laughs> here. Love you. Love you, darling. Um, <laughs> but there are molecules you only make through chemical reactions. And that's just much more, you know, that's just how, that's how molecules are made. You know, like the scientist isn't like, Oh, like I'm going to make this by pulling some carbon out of the drawer and then some oxygen. It's like, no, you're going to make products. Like that's what you're, that's what you're going to do. You need products of different reactions. And so, you know, players are building molecules in more complex ways. There's these secondary oxidation states. There's more elements. There's, it's basically just like a bigger, more complex version of the first game. Mm -hmm. So is that more geared towards uh, upper level chemistry students or is that, you know, you know, it's, is, it, is that like an AP level or, or honors by well, honors I chemistry? I not AP level yet. I mean, I'll, you know, it's like, I would say that valence plus is like, it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more chemistry in terms of like, yes, there are secondary oxidation states. You're building some molecules purely from reactions. So it's a little bit more of the emphasis. It's not like much more advanced. Like I tested this, I tested valence plus with high school kids. I also tested it with kids in fifth grade. Um, okay. You know, like I, I, I'm very big on testing, testing. Like if, if you're not testing 
your your games. I don't I don't know what you're doing, um, particularly with kids. Uh, so it's it's the game is designed so that like you could probably teach the rules and play a game and clean up in in span of a class time, but. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I think it's not like it's not like exponentially more complex than the first game, but I would say like yeah, like the first game, it's like okay, if you're like seven or eight year old kid, you want you want them, you're a parent, you want them to get like a leg up on chemistry, you know, you want to get them valence, and then like some older kids, like twelve, thirteen, fourteen, or even like adults that you know, like you were saying, just want to have beer and game night and want to learn some chemistry. Um, you know, like Valence Plus is geared a little bit more to them. So something, by the way, that I find very interesting about this too is, um, you know, I encounter a lot of people in the non-science world because because it's a game, mm-hmm. and um, adults are so intimidated by the game, and children they jump right into it. Yeah, well, it's just a game to them. It's like, oh, it's a game. There are rules. I can just learn the rules. I learn new games all the time. And adults mm-hmm. go like, oh, I didn't do well in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have all that. They're carrying all that baggage already. Exactly. Yeah, you know, they, they carry a lot of baggage, and it's it's fun to see like the the kids. The kids just don't really. They just don't have that at all, you know. And 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 like we were saying before, kids want to learn stuff. Like like I've I've never seen a kid be like, oh, this is an educational game. Like that's stupid. Like. I don't know. I've, I've never heard anything like that. So how many people can play the games? Uh, so, you know, if we're thinking about getting them for our classrooms, what do you what do you need? You got a class of 28? 28, you need seven games, I'd say. Like, uh, like you get more than... You can play with five people, but it's very slow. Okay. And I think it's a better game with, like, three or four people. So, so both, I, game, I, both I, games? Both games, yeah. Huh. Both games, like, four people. I'd say, you, yeah, you, you might be able to get five a little bit easier in Valence Plus, but it just, I'm also somebody that likes kind of quick games, you sure. know, like if you're somebody that, like, you know, if you if you really want to, like, lounge and play a long game of something, then you could probably play five or six with Valence Plus. With Valence, it's like, I think it's going to, like, I don't think you could play with, with, uh, with six with Valence. You might be able to get away with five, but, you know, we did a lot of testing on this, and it's like, yeah, like four is kind of the ideal number. Yeah, and you wouldn't have to have the whole class using it either, so you could have some differentiation yeah. going on, and some are playing the game at the time. So, yeah, it's a lot of a lot of teachers use it as like a station or something like that. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's something that can also be like, oh, you're done with your work, you guys can play the game. You know, like that's that's another that's another application that some teachers have told me about. Instead of punishing students with more work, you you know, let them. <laughs> Exactly. And actually, like, so Amanda Simpson, who, um, who helped me create the first game, um, she's, a, she's a professor at, of chemical engineering at uh, the Cooper Union. Um, she actually does some summer sessions at a, oh, God, what school is it? School in the Bronx. So she does some summer sessions um, where she's teaching chemistry to kids. And they played the game. They love the game. But she also just uses the cards as a teaching tool because... It's just like you have this physical representation of hydrogen or this physical representation of a different molecule. And, you know, like, you know, a lot of teachers just use it as like a flashcard of just like, oh, well, if I combine this element with this element, will this work? And it just it gives a it just gives a more tactile feeling to something that's pretty abstract. So what's next? Uh, Valence plus two? Well, I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little break from uh, chemistry for a little while, unless unless I get like struck with a really uh, really great idea, um, which which might happen. Um, so I'm in the middle of this graphic novel right now. It's called yeah. Big, Trouble, Big Trouble with Simple Machines. Um, it's about 100 pages. I'm really hoping I get it done by the end of the year, but it is a lot of work. I'm actually having um, quite a few science teachers help me edit the book. Uh, making sure that it's something that, you know, like I'm not missing anything really glad. Got to make sure your mechanical advantages are all working, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. I want to make sure I got everything leveraged properly. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm really, bump. thank you. Thank you. Um, Would you say you're gearing up for this one? Oh, <laughs> here we go. Wait, you just stop wedging the puns into this. <laughs> oh God. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're screwed on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sitting sorry, here going go incline, incline plank, incline plank. <laughs> okay, back. 
I'm not, I, I got nothing. Uh, <laughs> which is terrible because I'm writing a book. I should, I should have more stupid puns like that. <laughs> maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing that I don't have that many stupid puns in my book. Yeah, um, as a father of uh, te- uh, teenagers that you just get tons of eye rolls. So the cool factor <laughs> would be going out the window pretty quick. <laughs> you know what, though? I had a lot of puns. And the funny thing is, is I might have like crickets in the classroom. But many, many students later on would talk about, they would remember those and they would yeah, be like, mine too. oh, you made it so fun. And I'm like, oh, I, yeah, when you guys didn't laugh at me, yeah, that was awesome. The problem <laughs> is, you know, you were, you're you like a comedian. You're just kind of doing the set. I, I had them written in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like a tight five. Something that I find is that there's a lot of, lot of jokes like as a kid that I, I wouldn't even laugh at, or I wouldn't even really think are funny. And I think back on now and they were like hilarious. Like I remember like when someone like spit, when you talk, you'd say like, say it, don't spray it. And it's like, <laughs> it's a really mean, like kind of funny thing to say. <laughs> I don't oh, know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like some of the, sometimes those things, I think it's just like, especially like young teenagers, like good Lord, like they're not going to laugh. They're not going to laugh at anything an adult says. Anything that comes out of your mouth is just suspect. So um, you know, I think I think that stuff just like yeah, it's like you said, it just lodges in later. Um, I'm gonna get this graphic novel wrapped up, hopefully by the end of the year. And and basically on the back burner, I have a new game that I really want to work on, um, and I want it to be about um, voltage and current. Ooh. Um, I really want to teach circuits, and I, I have this really cool idea for a game. I'm a little nervous because it's. Um, you know, like I know how to make these card games now, but this would be something like basically I want to make a game where it's a competitive game where players are building circuits on a circuit board. Yes. Um, and it's <laughs> it's it seems pretty like it's a, it's a cool idea. I'm working everything out, but it's going to be a real uh, it's going to be a real project to, to learn how to produce this. So I had some students of I was a physics teacher. I had some students of mine do that. Oh wow! Really? They they made a, a sort of a circuit game um, on their own. Same thing, sort of like you get points if you can build. It was. I'll have to go and dig it up. Uh, some. Yeah, some, maybe I could get some. Maybe I could get some good ideas, or maybe maybe science just could hire them. And yeah, just, it's. I had lot. Yeah, yeah. Better. That that sounds it's, that sounds awesome. What's very tough about making a lot of these science games, though, is to actually make them games. It's very easy to make. Um, so you guys know the difference between a game and a puzzle? Like, I don't know. It's like a distinction that, that it, it seems a little trivial, but it's, it's pretty significant. So a puzzle, once you solve it, it's like you just know how to solve it. So okay. the replay value of a puzzle is, is pretty low, whereas like making a game, uh, it's something that's different every time. Mm-hmm. And so... To make a, uh, you know, to, to it's it, it's a little bit of a tension when you're teaching scientific material like this because you have these principles that you're trying to sort of hammer home, but you really got to make sure that uh, it's not the same thing every time. Because there there are a few of these like circuit quote unquote like games on the market, and I've like tinkered around with them, but they're really just like puzzles. It'll be like it's like try to build this in I don't know like a minute or something like that, and oh, I want to sure. make something. I want to make something that really has like a competitive strategy and that, uh, you know, like something like, uh, you know, Catan is such a popular game because Mm -hmm. it's different every single time you play it. So the idea of, uh, you know, building a different circuit every time and having different obstacles every time that's sort of randomized, it's it's tricky and it's going to require a whole lot of parts. But I really think that there's like, um, like people love these circuit kits. Like people really like playing with something tangible that gives them a handle on electricity. And I think it's going to be just in terms of what, of what our population needs to know in the future, like mm-hmm. learning efficient ways to deal with electricity is just, you know, it's, it's absolutely vital. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's what, when I first became a home homeowner, someone helped me through and he's like, well, you know, the thing with electricity is, it either works or it doesn't, and you'll know <laughs> immediately. That's what yeah. I like about electricity. That's where plumbing is the complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, electricity doesn't drip out. And yes, pool well, in the corner. Voltage, but yeah, yeah, making a plumbing game as well. But it's like <laughs> oh. it seems like it could be very, very messy. But that's definitely something that that you know, like I mean, yeah, fluid dynamics. Like that's very interesting stuff too. But I also think, like, I remember just like. Um, you know, like I had like this really, um, 
this apartment that was just in like a whole, it was a very, very raw space. And, um, and it was huge. And I built a gallery there. Uh, this was in the Bronx in like uh, early 2000s or something like that. But uh-huh. it was incredibly raw. And so I had to set up my own track lighting. And I remember like, you know, I, I bought the coaxial cable and, you know, I, I wired everything. And when you just flip that switch and the light turns on, it's just it's just one of the best feelings in the world. Um, <laughs> yeah. I thought that was going to go that story was going to go a different way. And I don't remember much of that because I did my own lighting. <laughs> <laughs> and I flipped the switch and it didn't work. And, <laughs> and then I woke up in Nebraska. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that sounds like a way more interesting story. Um, <laughs> but so, it, it is it is fascinating stuff. And, and I think that, like, you know, like like trying to get that that vibe like I, I really want to make a game where basically you win the game when you when you flip the switch and you turn you turn the lights on oh. um, i think that would be that would just be like a an incredible an, an, an incredible game and and uh, yeah mm-hmm. gonna develop that i'm gonna basically develop that on paper first um and then i'm gonna have to like figure out exactly how i'm gonna like manufacture and produce everything sure what makes a game flop I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of different like oh, listen, man, we talked so about my... style and things like that, but the design of a game, what can what in the game design can kill it the fastest? Oh, there's so many things, but um, like uh, this is this is like uh, I'm I'm a little nervous about giving out my my secrets here. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is this like is, magician's this code is a good here. Way to test the game, but this is a good way to test a game. You have to test a game where you assume the mentality of a player that does not care about fun, that does not care about having fun. The only thing you want to do is win. Like a nine list. Oh, yes. Oh, just want to win. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So you, you don't, you don't want to like, you, you, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to explain this, but like, okay, when you're playing Valence, like you might be like, oh, that's a cool looking card. I want to make it. Like you have to ignore all that and just play as the most ruthless, maybe the most joyless type of player. You're only trying to win because there will be players that do that and if people adopt that strategy and they play your game, um, very often it, it sucks because, you know, like you, you need to incentivize, you, you need to make the cool features of your game. You need to give the players an incentive to do them. Mm. So it's just like a lot of times like a game can really suck if it just gets really lopsided really quickly. There's no way to come back. Like, did you guys ever play Mario Kart? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so so Mario Kart, there's this great, um, there's that that purple shell that you get in Mario Kart, um, and you only get it when you're in last place. So Mario Kart, for anybody that doesn't know Mario Kart, it's like like eight characters and they're racing on a track, and mm-hmm. you get these little prizes. And when you're in last place, you get the best prizes. So what it does is it makes it so like like if if a player is checking out of the game because they're just like, oh, there's no way that I can win, mm-hmm. like that's like that's where your game has failed because you don't ever want somebody who's playing your game to be disengaged you basically want the game to end and you want everyone to go like let's play again like that's what you want like if a game ends and everyone's all like finally like let's let's get out of here like that that means your game is is in trouble and and when it's lopsided when it's like yeah when when a player is winning the game and there's no way for someone to to come back um then they're disengaged it's interesting. That sounds a lot like lesson planning. <laughs> Thinking about all your students, you got to make sure that you have uh, a way for everybody to stay engaged. Yeah, you got to keep everybody on board. The, the difference, I guess, is that like um, in a class, you don't you're not you're not trying to knock down the smartest kids. Whereas, like in a- <laughs> usually, <laughs> sometimes uh, usually not. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they're asking for it. I guess, but but in, in a game, you have to make the leader. Um, you have to make the leader pretty vulnerable. So you really need to make sure that, that everybody can be engaged, that everybody can come back. Like, like what you need to include is some disruptive factor into the game. Um, and, and, and there's, this is like where things get a little bit tricky. There's this big trend in gaming that's been going on for a while that, um, so like what's typically described as the worst game of all time is Candyland. Mm. Candyland is a game where yes. beautiful board. I will say that Candyland has a beautiful board. I'll give it that. But um, the only decision you make in Candyland is what, what color piece you're going to make. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's, it's all the dice. Oh, it's not even dice. It's cards. Oh, that's right. It's cards. It's yeah. a stupid card that tells you what color to move to. <laughs> um, you know, so this is a this is a boring game. Um, but isn't that and, supposed to teach them about like taking turns and things like that? 
Well, that's the way life is, Nathan. Yeah. This is a game. This is no, there's a lot, but 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 factoring in how much luck plays a role in your game is is very tricky, and it takes a certain bit of finesse because if there's no luck at all in the game, um, you know, like a game can be. Um, it isn't really fun to play a game with someone who's better than you. Like you yeah. know, like do you want to lose at chess all the time? Like <laughs> I don't want to play chess with my wife. Like she's just going to destroy me each time. You know, whereas if there's some element of luck to it, you know, it's like, well, things can be uncertain and you have to a little any given Sunday kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's it's a tough balance that you want to strike. you got to figure out, like, well, how much is luck going to play a part and how much is how much is skill going to play a part? Because if it's all luck, too, it's just like, you know, like that's a very easy game to get disengaged with as well. You know, it's like, well. You know, like who, nothing, nothing matters. Time is a flat circle. Like who cares? You know, like it's it's just something that <laughs> no one is really going to care about. Um, but if it's too strategy based, if it's too like, you know, if it, if, it, if the bias is towards players that have um, played the game before um, having a really strong advantage, that's also something that that I would want to steer clear from as well. So so a lot of it is just figuring out the balance. It's it's really really it's it's like a it's more of an art than a science. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating to think about it that way. And and again, kind of putting it back by lesson planning, too. We've had conversations like this before where, you know, there's a lot of art, even within that science and the and the strategy, too. It's I love hearing that. It's, it's, yeah. it's great. We have the luxury, though, where, Nathan, you make your game, you make the rules, you box it up, and that's how it's played. When yeah. we do a lesson, we can, you know, can change on the fly. So that yeah. that's one advantage we have. First we hour is the draft. The Second hour is uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're about to go into our third printing with Valence, and I do make little changes around the huh. edges. Like like that's something that you know, like uh, for instance, like the first printing, like there was this there was this rule that whenever anybody built carbon dioxide, you would take a card from another player, and um, for some reason, this was very confusing to people. And very often people just, even in games that I would play, I was it a carbon footprint thing or what? Yeah, it was just, it was just sort of an idea like that, you know, like it it was, and it was also like, just like a lot of the molecules, they had sort of like something, you know, the bases were vulnerable. The acids could attack. Um, What does carbon dioxide do? It just kind of stays there. So we wanted to just sort of give it some sort of functionality and it just, you know, it, it just, for whatever reason, it just didn't work with the game. And so we just like eliminated that. And, um, you know, like so that was trying to balance your luck and strategy and didn't really work out as well is what you're saying. Yeah, it's just sometimes people just sometimes a rule is just superfluous too. Sometimes people are just like, oh, I don't I, I, I never remember to do that. If, if, if people are constantly forgetting to, oh, sure. <laughs> to implement a rule, then, you know, you should get rid of it. And in fact, in this new printing, we're actually doing uh, a new thing where um, we're making some of the. We're, we're actually we're we're slowing the game down in some ways and we're speeding it up in other ways. Like something that I've been concerned about is that uh, in valence, like I want, like I said before, like the centerpiece of valence is the chemical reactions, and I really want to make sure that players are doing that. So in the new game, when you when you uh, react with someone's base, you actually prevent them from drawing a card on their next turn. So you're punishing them a little bit more. So it just gives people a little bit more incentive to do those chemical reactions. And because that slows the game down a little bit, and like I said, I'm really a big fan of like, let's have the games move quick. I really want people to be like, let's play again when they're done with the game rather than like, oh, that's, thank God that's over. So, <laughs> I, so I've increased the point value of, of some of the cards as well. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it gives players, it, it's a little bit more of a bias towards decisions now because it's like, okay, reacting is a little bit more, you have more incentive to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's just, you just have more incentive to do things. So, so you can make these little changes around the edges that I do think, I do think really help. A lot of it is just like listening to your, to your users, listening to your customers and, and hearing what they want. Like I also really make sure to, to and I put this in the rule book every time is like you can also just focus on building molecules and not focus on on the reactions and that's really great for like younger kids um, you know when they're when they're uh, you know a five or six year old kid they're just learning addition and subtraction um, adding up to zero is is it's like one of those things it's like uh, a kid can add 
two plus two, a kid can do four minus two, but you ask them what two minus two is, and, and that can really, that really sticks some kids. So just eliminating the reaction part and just focusing on building the molecules, like, like basically giving your customers a few different ways that they can play the game mm-hmm. can have, it can, it can insert a little bit of that um, kind of on the fly quality you're talking about. Like we also encourage people to play the game cooperatively where you're just trying to build all of the molecules in the game before you run out of cards. Uh, so there's just different, there's different modes. And, and I think that that can work a little bit because it's like, yeah, it's like not every, not every classroom is the same, I'm sure. And you got to make adjustments from, from yeah. year to year, from period to period. And, and just like that, every, every household that's playing a game has different needs too. Mm-hmm. Well, you got Valence, you got Valence Plus. We got this circuits game that I'm, it's, it's just a dream right now, but I'm oh, loving man, the I idea. And you've also got the, um, the graphic novel, the Simple Machines graphic novel coming out. Big trouble with Simple Machines. We also sell a periodic table poster, which is just like you know, it's 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 your standard periodic table poster. It's mm-hmm. got the new elements though, so. But you can't have enough of those. I, I remember, like, I, I collected some of those, and they were just kind of like wallpaper. It was great. So, if yeah, listeners and- are interested, Nathan, how do they find your your games, your creations? Well, uh, you can come onto our website, scienceninjas.com. And um, what's cool about the website is that we have, uh, you know, and there's links. We sell all of our stuff on Amazon. But mm-hmm. if you go to our website, you can also read the comics that we have. So we have, like, comics. And when I say we, it's like the royal we. I guess it's me and my wife. Yeah. Um, I, I have this habit of doing that. I always got to catch myself. I'm like, we, it just, I don't know. It, 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 it always sounds a little bit more vulnerable. Well, you and separate. the characters. Yeah, sure. Me and my me and my um, ninjas, imaginary friends that I that I draw. Um, but there's like comics about friction. There's comics about uh, density. Like something that I'm really proud of is uh, there's a college professor that actually uses one of my comics to explain. Uh, there's there's this there's this there's this comic that explains uh, why warm air rises, and uh, mm-hmm. and it's actually an animated comic. So it says. It poses the question, well, how many ninjas could you fit in an elevator if they're dancing to slow romantic music? And uh, Wait, wait, this is density? Yeah, this is about, no, this is about why warm air, this is about why warm air rises, okay? Okay, okay. So how many, how many, how many ninjas could you fit in an elevator if they're dancing to slow romantic music? I don't know. How many ninjas could well, you fit in an elevator? No, no, I mean, I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, no, how many, how many ninjas could you fit in that elevator? If they're, is if, it a freight elevator or like yeah, hotel tell us elevator about or... It's 25. a regular standard, regular standard elevator. Whatever the elevator is in your mind. It's how right. are they dancing? Slowly and to romantic music. Slowly and to um, romantic music. I'm going to go with Well, eight. it's got to be, yeah, it's got to be Good, pairs. Okay. I like that. I like that. Eight. Okay. So how many ninjas could you fit in an elevator, in the same elevator, if they were break dancing? Uh, well, it's got to be less. Four. Well, sure. Like, it's going to be fewer. So... Mm-hmm. Those breakdancing ninjas, and this is all animated. There's like, yeah, yeah but, but if, if they're, they're synchronized, synchronized breakdancing ninjas. <laughs> well, sure, but the breakdancing ninja, that's like a warm air molecule, okay? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's moving a lot more, it's moving faster, it's taking up more room. And the slow romantic music dancing ninjas, they're they're the, the colder air molecule, so they're moving much slower. So that's a heavier. Okay, I have elevator. to see the video now. <laughs> now. This is the kind of thing that it's like. If I have some weird dreams tonight, Nathan. <laughs> oh my I gosh! Hope, so I hope you dream of break dancing ninjas. <laughs> And there's the show title. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. Well, <laughs> Nathan, we could go on and on with you. This is awesome. Um, definitely send our listeners over to Science Ninjas and uh, take a look at the animations and your dancing ninjas in an elevator and Absolutely. all the games that you have to offer. Thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you, guys. It's great. It was a pleasure. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about today's episode, head on over to our website, laboutloud.com, for more information. You can also find details about all the previous episodes, and you can leave us feedback and comments. We want to hear from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you've subscribed on iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite podcasting platform. And if you really enjoyed it, consider leaving us a rating or a review. Your feedback helps others find our show. 
If you like Lab Out Loud and you love the show that we provide for you, please consider supporting the show at our Patreon page. Head on over to patreon.com slash laboutloud for more information. Until next time, I'm Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. 